Hello, my name is Pastor Jeremy Kaliba, and I'm the pastor of Church of the Open Bible, and I want to welcome you to our podcast in Proverbs as we're looking at a, a chapter of Proverbs a day uh, for the month of January, for whatever month or day that you find yourself in. Things are not always as they seem. Have you ever bought something maybe online and when it arrives, you're like, oh, that's a lot different than I thought. Maybe it's a lot smaller or a lot tighter or a lot cheaper than it looked on the website. I know I've been there. There's Things are not always as they seem uh, at first perception. And Proverbs 5 continues to commend the way of wisdom by zooming in on one aspect of life in particular and, and showing with it how things are not always as they seem. As we read through the chapter, the author especially uses contrast to emphasize what he's teaching. So look for those contrasts as we read in Proverbs chapter 5. My son, be attentive to my wisdom. Incline your ear to my understanding that you may keep discretion, and your lips may guard knowledge. For the lips of a forbidden woman drip honey, and her speech is smoother than oil, but in the end she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps follow the path to Sheol. She does not ponder the path of life. Her ways wander, and she does not know it. And now, O sons, listen to me, and do not depart from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her, and do not go near the door of her house, lest you give your honor to others and your years to the merciless, lest strangers take their fill of your strength and your labors go to the house of a foreigner. And at the end of your life you groan when your flesh and body are consumed. And you say, how I hated discipline and my heart despised reproof. I did not listen to the voice of my teachers or incline my ear to their, my instructors. I am at the brink of utter ruin in the assembled congregation. Drink water from your own cistern, flowing water from your own well. Should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets... Let them be for yourself alone and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely deer, a graceful doe. Let her breasts fill you at all times with delight, be intoxicated always in her love. Why should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman and embrace the bosom of an adulteress? For man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his paths. The iniquities of the wicked ensnare him, and he is held fast in the cords of his sin. He dies for lack of discipline, and because of his great folly, he is led astray. Wisdom, as it has been defined so far in Proverbs, is living according to God's character and order. And how do we live according to God's character and order? By faith, not blindly, but trusting in who he has revealed himself to be. If we are to trust God in all our ways, that means every aspect of life. And one of those aspects is marriage. Some of you are single and want to be married. Some of you are married and want to be single. And some of you are single and want to be single. Regardless, you you can't avoid marriage either in your life or in the lives of those you know and love. Wisdom regarding it is essential. Secondly, marriage points to something much deeper that affects all of us. Right off the bat in the first two verses, the father reminds the son of his need for wisdom. And then the father begins the lesson concerning marriage and adultery in verses 3 to 14. And he begins by describing what the son will see when it comes to the adulteress. Look at verse 3. He says, For the lips of a forbidden woman drip honey, and her speech is smoother than oil. Son, what you might see when it comes to a relationship with a married woman is honey and oil, sweetness and smoothness, ease, 
But the father's quick to say things are not always as they seem. What is it that the son will get? We'll look in the next few verses. What you see is honey, but what you get is bitterness, a bitter herb. What you see is smoothness, but what you get is sharpness like a sword and death. Isn't this true of life? In, in this broken world, evil is not always ugly. Sin can masquerade as beauty and attraction can cover up destruction. One of the men who discipled me when I was younger, a mentor of mine with a loving wife, growing kids, a number of grandkids, one day he ran away with a married woman around 30 years younger, literally ran away just like that. She had a husband, kids of her own. It destroyed families, a community. But any number of us can share examples of that, maybe even from our own life. What we have portrayed here is the decaying delight of unfaithfulness. The decaying delight of unfaithfulness. And and that delight decays rapidly. It, It is rancid, putrid. It molds, it withers, and it destroys those who venture on her path. We'll find more of this in chapter 6 and 7. Things are not always as it seems when it comes to unfaithfulness in marriage. But what I love about this chapter is that the father doesn't end here. He doesn't just say, avoid her path. He tells the son where this delight can be found, where it should be found, and that is in marriage. So these figurative verses describe the profuse pleasure of faithfulness. Listen to uh, verses 18 and 19. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely deer, a graceful doe. Let her breasts fill you at all times with delight, be intoxicated always in her love. The Bible doesn't blush, does it? But what you might not notice is that these two verses are a prayer. And what does the father pray for his son? That his son will have an intimate relationship with his wife marked by blessing, joy, and continuing satisfaction. This is what the father prays for his son. This is the attractiveness of the marriage relationship, intimacy, knowing. But while this is being held out to him, there is something that the son must give in return. And we see this in verse 15 through 17. Drink water from your own cistern, flowing water from your own well, Should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets, let them be for yourself alone and not for strangers with you. The contrast in these verses is between the sun cistern, a well, a spring, streams, against sharing them with strangers in the public square. This is what the sun must give. This is the necessary mark of the marriage relationship and the resulting intimacy, exclusivity, faithfulness. That's what that means, not possession, but partnership. Drink from your own well. Stick to your wife. And rather than bitterness, you'll be blessed with water that stays fresh, running. Do you see the lie that's been offered by our culture? It's exactly opposite of what we find in our text. What is culture's definition of a refreshing, satisfying, captivating relationship? Well, it's anyone you choose. Promiscuity. What is culture's definition of a stale and bitter relationship? Well, it's commitment to one person. Exclusivity, marriage, that's the exact opposite of what wisdom tells us, of what God tells us. Let's look at those closing verses in verse 21 to 23. For a man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his paths. The iniquities of the wicked ensnare him, and he is held fast in the cords of his sin. He dies for lack of discipline. And because of his great folly, he is led astray. The father brings home this lesson to the son by grounding it in the Lord. The Lord sees everything and is just. There is nothing the son can hide from the Lord. He watches the paths. He knows the paths. And he knows where they lead. The way of life is established by God. This definitely applies to our sexuality. God designed a a specific path for it, a path with form and freedom, the form of faithfulness in a marriage relationship. One man, one woman, one flesh for one lifetime. And within that form to experience profuse pleasure. So, So what about you? I want to encourage you to be captivated in commitment, 
married folks, be captivated in commitment to your spouse. If you're not captivated by the love of your spouse and you become captivated by another, your own sin will captivate you. In marriage, it's important for us to know that we have an enemy and that enemy is not our spouse. Satan hates God-honoring marriages, so practice faithfulness towards your spouse with intention and effort and by the Spirit. And for all of us, be captivated in commitment to God, captivated by his love for you. It's so easy for us to look outside ourselves. If only I stay away from that. Here's the truth. I, I don't need to be rescued from what is outside of me. I need to be rescued from what's inside me because the problem is my heart, a heart that wanders in its commitment to God. It starts with asking for grace from God to change my heart, and it continues by his grace as we trust his wisdom, living according to his character, listening, living, and leaving his wisdom for those behind us. And go in peace. All glory be to Christ our